let's get to our message for today. This is part nine of Providence and Choice. Today's date is August 29th, 2020. And Tesha Be'elul, Hamashim V'sheva Shmonim, the ninth day of Elul, 5780. And today, what I want to talk to us about is something that it, I'm going to begin. We're, we're not going to finish up today. I'm, we're going to have to continue this particular line of consideration um, next Shabbat as well, because we need to flesh, we'll need to flesh this out some more. But this is something that might be a little difficult to wrap our heads around, um, just simply because uh, theoretically it's not something that we end up thinking much about. Um, there, there is almost. And, and I hope you guys can understand what I mean by what I'm about to say. If I, if I need to explain it more, I can. But there's almost like a, um, like a mean level of understanding kind of across the board generally with most believers. In other words, you can bring up certain topics and most people will have at least um, some level of knowledge and understanding on that topic and can converse about it. But there are other issues having to do with, with theology, with God, with his nature, etc., that are a bit deeper that not very many people end up even considering and don't have really much knowledge on. In fact, you know, as, I, as we start talking about this today, it may be something that you never even considered ever in your life, okay? But this is something that has very much to do with helping us to understand how things work, I guess is the best way to say it, when it comes to the ability to choose as a created being and the providence or the power and authority that Hashem has as the creator. Because there, there has to be, you know, the whole reason why we're going through this is there's, there's this dance that goes on between us and Hashem. <clears throat> it's not easy to decipher um, where what he does cuts off and where what we do takes over. And I even think, I don't think there's like any solid line um, present where you can say, okay, here it's a straight line and you just come up to this line and that's God and then from this line over here is us. It's like it, it's constantly moving and changing with the circumstances and so it can become difficult for us in reality trying to live out this life. That's the reason why we have such difficulty like when we pray about things. Um, and it, it, it's never more clear than when we're praying for someone who is ill, who is maybe even on their deathbed. Um, we, we're given instructions in the Word that we're supposed to do certain things and we do them and, and sometimes we don't see the results that we think that we should see and it makes us question and go, did, you know, is it my fault? Did I, was it that I didn't pray the right thing? Or, you know, it, there's this constant, like, battle and turmoil inside of us 
with how much is on me and how much is on God. And so it's, it's constant and we, we don't ever, it's not like you get to a point where you don't ever have that conflict anymore. So we're trying to, with these messages, trying to kind of navigate this to help us to better understand Hashem doesn't want us to constantly live in a state where we are thinking that we're not good enough or that we haven't done enough, okay? What he looks at, and we've talked about this in, in previous parts, he is looking for people who will respond to him and come, come to him, towards him. And as, he, as we come towards him, then he comes to meet us in response to that. And so this may be a little bit heady um, for some. My, it's not my intention to be that way, but it's something that we have to consider. And, and the, the argument, uh, argument's not really the right word, the discussion about this centers around or is, or it plays off of the relationship between Hashem and the angels. Okay? And you're gonna, you're probably scratching your head, well, what, did, what does their relationship with Hashem have to do with our relationship with Hashem? Well, we need to, there's something that happens that we need to understand. Because it has, even though we're not angels and the angels are not us, and our roles are different and, and all of that is different, nevertheless, there is a, There's a relational cause and effect that occurs between Hashem and the angels that is similar to or like what happens with us, okay? So I'm, I know I'm kind of talking around, around this, so let's get right into it. Theologians for centuries have debated about whether or not angels have free will. Okay, and you know the argument is that since angels can't be redeemed that they instead are either created for good or for evil. In other words, Hashem predetermined for the angels whether they were going to end up being good or evil angels, okay. And in fact, the Jewish sages, by and large, insist that angels do not possess the ability to choose, but act only according to the will of Hashem. Okay? But, capital B, capital U, capital T, this actually and, and it, it, it's surprising to me, actually, that the Jewish sages believe this. Because not only does this defy logic, but it also defies what the scripture says. And because we have to, lo just lo the logical conclusion that we have to come to is, if they only do, in essence, what they're programmed to do by Hashem, then how could there have been a rebellion of angels in heaven? Okay? The scripture very clearly says they rebelled. Okay? So we're going to take a look at some, some Bible verses that help us make this argument. Uh, 
uh, verses that indicate the ability to choose on the part of the angels. So first we're going to go to Yehuda or Jude, verse 6, page 1531 and 1781. 1531 in the Complete Jewish Bible, 1781 in the Complete Jewish Study Bible. Yehuda, Jude, verse 6. You know, Yehuda or Jude is only, it's only one chapter, so there's not, there's only verses. Yehuda writes, and the angels that did not keep within their original authority, but abandoned their proper sphere, he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. Now, we could go off into a big long discussion, a side discussion on what all this means, and we've had such discussions in the past about what does it mean to, to not keep within your original authority and abandon your proper sphere, etc. But that's not, the, that's not for the purpose of this particular message. Just the very fact that Yehuda writes that they did not keep within their original authority but abandoned their proper sphere would immediately indicate to us that they're not programmed. Okay? Otherwise, if they were, it would have been impossible for them to do this. They would have been like programmed robots who just do what they're created to do, and that's all that they do. Okay? <clears throat> and eventually we're going to actually get to a passage in Yechezkiel. Most of these passages are in the Brit Kharashah, the new, new co renewed covenant scriptures. All right. The next one is found in Kepha Beit, or 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 3b and 4, and that's 1522 and 1766, pretty much next door to Yehuda. So, Kepha Beit, 2 Peter 2, 3b, and 4. <clears throat> it says, Their punishment, decreed long ago, is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. For God did not spare the angels who sinned. On the contrary, he put them in gloomy dungeons lower than Sheol to be held for judgment. So here Shimon Kepha is basically echoing the same um, idea, same concept as what we read from Yehuda. Okay? He's just saying it in a little bit different, different way. But here the terminology that is used is that the angels sinned. Okay? And then we, we read in Luke 10, 18, Yeshua said to them, I saw Hasatan fall like lightning from heaven. And we connect that with Yechezkiel, Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 11 through 19 page 677 and 752. Yechezkiel, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. Now, I want to, while you're writing the passage in your notes and finding your place in the Bible, I do want to say this. 
this is a prophetic utterance that is being given to Yehezkel to deliver to a human king, okay, the king of Tzor. However, the language that is used here, there is a, there's a message to this king, but the description that is given here cannot, cannot and does not apply to a human being. It's clearly speaking about an angelic being, okay? And as we read, you'll understand what I mean. It says, um, the word of Adonai came to me, human being, raise a lament for the king of Tzor and tell him that Adonai Elohim says, you put the seal on perfection. You are full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, covered with all kinds of precious stones, carnelians, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphires, green feldspar, emeralds. Your pendants and jewels were made of gold, prepared the day you were created. You were a karuv, protecting a large region. I placed you on God's holy mountain. You walked back and forth among the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. When your commerce grew, you became filled with violence, and in this way you sinned. Therefore I have thrown you out, defiled from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, protecting Karuv, from among the stones of fire. Your heart grew proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. But I have thrown you on the ground. Before kings I have made you a spectacle. By your many crimes in dishonest trading you have profaned your sanctuaries. There, therefore I brought you forth fire from within you, and it has devoured you. I reduced you into ashes on the ground in the sight of all who can see you. All who know you among the peoples will be aghast at you. You are an object of terror, and you will cease to exist. So this is very clearly, even though it's a message, a lament for the king of Tzor, this is very clearly a description of what transpired with Hasatan. Okay? So basically we have we have a story, the story being told of the creation of Lucifer, his role that he played in the heavens. When it's when it talks about God's holy mountain, he's not talking about Hartzion in, in Jerusalem. He's talking about the throne room in heaven. Okay? This is using symbolic language. Okay? So it says you were a protecting, you were a karuv, protecting a large region. You walked back and forth among the stones of fire. The stones of fire are in the temple of Hashem in the heavens. Okay? Then it talks about sinning and being cast down and so on. So this is very clearly a, a description of Hasatan. And you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Same thing could have been said, obviously, of Adam and Chava. They were perfect from the day that Hashem created them until unrighteousness was found in them. And just like Hashem had to cast Lucifer out of the heavens down to the earth, 
Hashem had to cast Adam and Chava out of Gan Eden, out of the Garden of Eden. Because it, the Garden of Eden was a holy place. It was a, basically a replica of the heavenlies, a, a holy and righteous, perfect place. And, and sin can't be there. And so they had to be kicked out of that holy place. Then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, page 1543 and 1796. Revelation 12, 7. Tells us next, there was a battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So here we have a very clear description of choosing to battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Okay? And then finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, page Rav Shaul is rebuking the Corinthians here. And he makes a statement in the middle of his rebuke that's interesting. He says, How dare one of you, with a complaint against another, go to court before pagan judges and not before God's people? Don't you know that God's people are going to judge the universe? If you're going to judge the universe, are you incompetent to judge these minor matters? Don't you know that we will judge angels, not to mention affairs of everyday life? So if you require judgments about matters of everyday life, why do you put them in front of men who have no standing in the Messianic community? I say, shame on you. Can it be that there isn't one person among you wise enough to be able to settle a dispute between brothers? Instead, a brother brings a lawsuit against another brother, and that before unbelievers. Okay, so we see the rebuke, but in the midst of this, he makes the statement that we're going to be judging angels. Well, why would we judge angels if they have no choice. Why, how and what, it, would it be just for us to judge a being that was programmed to do a particular thing, whether they wanted to or not? So it cannot be, the issue cannot be that they don't have any ability to choose. Okay? Now, what makes, so the question arises, if they have the ability to choose, why is it that the Jewish sages say that they don't? What, what, what is it that has caused this debate about whether or not angelic beings have the ability to choose? And this is where we're going to start, I'm going to raise the 
the issue, and we're going to start just, I'm kind of throwing out the tip of the iceberg, and then we're going to have to, next Shabbat, we're going to delve into this more, okay? In the writings of the sages, you will see in more than, on more than one occasion the phrase, the will of all wills, in reference to Hashem. The will of all wills. And this phrase is an attempt to describe a principle that exists. And that principle is the closer one gets to the manifest presence or the Shekhinah, the more one's will is overpowered by the will of Hashem. Okay? Let that kind of sink in to your heart and your head. Yeah. The closer one gets to the manifest presence, which, we, which the sages have called the Shekhinah, or the Shekhinah, the, depending on your pronunciation, the more one's will is overpowered by the will of Hashem. Hashem and the, way, the best way for me to describe this, to give you a place to start in your thinking process. And of course, at some point, this metaphor, this analogy breaks down. But the best way that I can describe where we can start even thinking about this concept is the idea of a black hole. Okay. The further away from a black hole you are, the less influence that black hole has on you. The closer you get, the gravity of a black hole is so immense. The closer you get, the more that gravity starts pulling on you, and there's what is called an event horizon and if you cross that event horizon, you cannot escape the grasp of the gravity of the black hole, and you will be sucked in to that black hole. The very essence and nature and presence of Hashem is so magnified like and again we you know we we lose the ability to describe we don't have the words and the concepts to actually accurately describe this so we have to pull from from things that we know and understand and that, and they are so inadequate to describe he is like the brightest star that could ever exist. The densest star that could ever exist. The closer you get to him, the more you are subsumed into who he is. So the reason why it appears, anyway, that the angels don't have free will is because of how close they are to the manifest presence of Hashem. For, let, let's just, let's give some for instances, even from the Bible. And I don't have particular uh, scripture passages that I can give to you, but I can give you examples even limited examples where when Hashem shows up in some form to man, how immediately 
people fall prostrate on their faces before him. You can't help it. There were, there were times where the Shekinah came down and it said they couldn't even stand in order to minister because the presence of God is so weighty and so overwhelming. And that's just a tiny, tiny taste of what he is and how, what kind of effect he has. And so the closer that you get to him, the more that his, who he is overwhelms you. And you can, al it's almost, you do have a choice, but it's almost as if you don't have a choice. You guys understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, she was saying the Ruach, part of the job of the Ruach HaKodesh is to draw us closer to the Father. And of course, the closer that we get, and again, this is so limited. When, when we're in this realm, in this body, everything is just hyper limited. When, when we leave this structure, this construct, and we're in the spirit, there won't be those kinds of limitations. Um, but the, the Ruach is to draw us closer to the Father, and the closer that we get, the more we end up doing His will, the more we want to do His will. There is... We will never stop having the ability to choose. That's the way that he made us. That's the way he intended for us to be. That continues beyond this existence. Choice is not just limited to being in a physical form. It is part of who the real us is. Okay? <clears throat> So we have the ability to choose. But when we get closer and closer to Hashem, then the idea of choosing something other than what He wants becomes moot. It's like, why? Why, why would you want to do something else? The closer that we get, it's like that's all I want to do is, is what he wants. So this whole idea, and I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, it just it touches me very deeply. Um, but this idea of the closer that we get to Hashem, the more we're overwhelmed or overpowered by, by him, by his presence. This is what is occurring with the angels. It's not that the angels don't have choice. It's that they are so close to him, it is as if they don't have choice. Especially the ones that are right there around the throne constantly. You know, not all of the angels are right there around the throne. There are some very specific angelic beings that were created for the purpose of surrounding the throne, the, the Kerovim. And, and the fact that Hasatan was called a Karuv every time I think, I try to wrap my head around the idea of Lucifer 
Of course, you guys understand that Hasatan is a title. It means the adversary. Okay, that's not his name. His name is Lucifer. The whole idea of Lucifer being a Karuv, in other words, being as close to Hashem as you possibly could be, and yet choosing to do what he did. I cannot. I don't know that I ever will be able to wrap my head around that and fathom that. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. And one of the things, I've, I've said this before, you know, I've, I've actually had people ask me specifically, okay, so we die and leave this body, or Yeshua comes back and we leave this body, and we're in this glorified state, which is very, it's not not the same as being like uh, being an angel, but it's sort of like an angelic being in that we're spiritual beings. What is going to keep us from repeating what was done before? You know, if Lucifer could be in that perfect environment, so close to Hashem and do what he did, what's going to keep us from doing that same thing again at some point in the future? And my answer, and who knows, maybe this answer is totally wrong. I, I don't know. But this is what has come to me. My answer is that we have lived a life within the ramification, ramifications and consequences of what sin does. Even if our life is short in comparison to eternity, it's long enough for us to go, this is crap. This is sewage. Why would I ever make a choice to leave that and go back to the sewage? I'll, I would never make that choice. That's how I know that it's not going to repeat. Because we've all experienced. See, when Lucifer made the choice that he, he made, he didn't make it from a place of experience. He had never done that before. It was all brand new. And when he made that choice, boom, it came down on him. I bet after he made that choice and the consequences fell, he, he wished that he had never done that. But by then it was too late. Okay? But with us, we're born into this. We have to endure this our entire life sin and sorrow and suffering and, and all of this that we have to endure. And we found somebody who loved us enough who could and would redeem us from all of this. and pick us up and pull us out of the torment and see the torment doesn't end with this life. If we're not redeemed, it goes on for eternity and it actually is worse than what we've endured here. But we had somebody that was willing to give themselves in order to redeem us and rescue us from that so that we wouldn't have to endure that anymore. And he's pulled me out of all of that. I've, I've got hope now that my future is going to be in the presence of Hashem. 
taking in, being absorbed, if you want to say that, by the living God. Why would I want anything else? To have, to have an eternity of that. Now I think we're going to have things that, to do. But even if we didn't have things to do, just being in His presence would be enough for me. So, I don't think Hashem's going to have any trouble out of us. I really don't. I think we're going to say, man, this is so good. I don't want to mess this up. Ever. So anyway, we're going to, I kind of went off on a bunny trail. Good bunny trail, but a bunny trail. We're going to talk about this some more next Shabbat flesh this out some more uh, because it has to do with how we interact with Hashem in, in, even in this life before we leave this body and are in His presence in a more manifest way it affects us here so with that let's pray Abba, the thinking about being in your presence excites me and is overwhelming to me emotionally. Father, I, we have a small foretaste here but it's nothing in comparison to what it will really be like when we're out of this body out of this sinful existence Father we thank you that at some point in the future you're going to wipe all of this out and start over and you're going to create something you're going to create a place for us all to be together that is doesn't have any of the elements that we are having to endure here. Instead, it will be a return to the way things were supposed to be, the way that you created things in the beginning, where the, where the earth and all that was in it was fresh and new and clean, righteous, holy, set apart for you, set apart for perfection and for joy and love and relationship. Father, that, that day can't come soon enough as far as I'm concerned. Father, I pray that as we continue in, in, the, in these messages, Lord God, that you would help us in our, with our finite minds to be able to at least in some way grasp um, these concepts. Father, so that we can rightfully understand our, react, our interaction with you. I pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen. <laughs>